Well, the heat wave from Boston to Baghdad to Beijing over the past few days is setting record-breaking temperatures in cities across the world. In Beijing, the mercury level hit a near record 105 degrees. In Baghdad, it was 113. In Kuwait, 122. Here in the United States, cities along the East Coast, from New York to Charlotte, all topped 100 degrees. Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Newark all set new record highs. Indeed, 2010 is set to be one of the world's hottest years on record, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association. The global average surface temperature for the first five months of the year was the warmest on record. Meanwhile, a new analysis says the world is headed for an average temperature rise that far exceeds pledges at the Copenhagen Climate Conference last year. According to the Cli Climate Interactive Scoreboard, temperatures are expected to rise nearly four degrees Celsius by the end of the century, double the maximum two degrees discussed in Copenhagen. A separate analysis from the Potsdam Institute in Germany says there's virtually no chance current pledges will keep temperatures below 2 degrees and predicts an increase of 3.5 degrees. Author Gwen Dyer joins us here in our studio, longtime journalist, columnist, and lecturer on international affairs. His twice weekly columns published in 175 newspapers in some 45 countries. Welcome to Democracy Now! Thank you. Can you lay out the scenario? Um, what you see could happen? The military themselves have begun making plans and making provisions for the kind of roles they foresee themselves having in a warming world. And really what drives almost all of their scenarios is that the principal impact of warming on human beings is on the food supply. That the hotter it gets, the less food we can grow. About one degree Celsius average global temperature rise, you lose 10 percent of the supply, global grain production rule of thumb. Um, and there's no slack in the system. I mean, we're eating all that we grow. And so what they see is uh, a variety of ills arising from a sh a sh an absolute shortage of food. Refugees, slash, you know, coming up against borders that don't want to let them in, but, you know, you're starving back home. Your farm is dried up and blown away. Um, you're trying to get into a place where there's still some food and they don't want to let you in. It gets very ugly in that sort of border. Failed states, a government that cannot feed its own people does not survive. I mean, that's, you know, job one, keep the people alive. If you can't do that, you have no credibility left. And in some cases, actual interstate wars, because um, in very many parts of the world, several countries share the same river, which is fine when there's enough water to go around. When there's not, uh, the upstream country has got a really serious temptation to just hold on to enough water for itself and, and to hell with the downstream countries, who then have the choice of fight or starve. Um, I mean, India and Pakistan, uh, Egypt versus the countries further up the Nile, um, Iraq versus Turkey. I think there might be a war between Iraq and Turkey today if Iraq wasn't flat on its back because the Turks are holding the water back and there's no water in the Euphrates River this year. The countries further away from the equator, temperate zone countries like the, most of the United States, bits of it are in the subtropics, but most of the United States is in the temperate zone, Europe, Japan, they're relatively unharmed by this until we get way deep into climate change. I mean, you'd have to be about three degrees before they start losing food production. But the tropics and the subtropics, which takes in about two thirds of the world, get hit very hard very early. Um, so that there, you know, the existing inequities are enormously magnified because it is precisely the poorer countries that are losing food production. Um, but so much so that there's an absolute global shortage, which means, of course, the poorest people start to starve. Can you talk about what geoengineering is? It's the whole card. It's the get out of jail free card. It's the only one I know of, frankly. I don't know a single scientist. Um, nor do I know many policymakers who, in their honest moments, think we are going to get our emissions down in time to avoid tumbling into potentially runaway climate change. The two degrees Celsius average global temperature, after that, we lose control. Natural factors, feedbacks from the permafrost melting and so on, take over and carry us up to really devastating levels of warming, four, five, six degrees. You're sort of trapped on this escalator and you can't get off. So if that's where we're heading, what do you do? And, you know, we'll do the best we can to cut the emissions, but it isn't going to happen in time. And the answer is geoengineering. You cheat. You find ways to hold the temperature down 
while you go on working at the project of getting your emissions down. That's a long-term solution. But if waiting, you know, just just getting your, your emissions down is your only technique, sorry, you're going to trigger the feedbacks, you're in runaway. So cheat. Basically, the, the phrase we're all going to know in two years' time is SRM, and that stands for Solar Radiation Management. And it's a variety of techniques for interrupting enough of the sunlight incoming from, you know, from space before it reaches the surface to keep the temperature somewhat lower. I'm not talking about enough that it gets dark at noon or something. One percent would do. Um, so you, you put sulfur dioxide in the stratosphere. I mean, we already dump a lot of it in the lower atmosphere, but put it up in the stratosphere where it'll stay for a couple of years. This is what big volcanoes do when they explode, and we actually get a cooler global temperature the year after a large volcano explodes. So we could do that. You know, we use mid-air refueling aircraft, put some sulfur dioxide in the stratosphere, or, you know, thicken up the clouds over the oceans, the low-lying cloud. Could this lead, uh, the, the threat of, of, of major uh, calamity lead to more push for uh, authoritarianism, oh, for military so. control uh, I, over our societies? I think that's true. I don't think necessarily, for example, I don't think the U.S. military want that. But I think it could well come out of this. But the initiative for uh, geoengineering is not coming out of the military. I mean, I've spent a lot of time on this. It's coming out of the scientific community, who even a couple of years ago had an absolute taboo on ever mentioning geoengineering engineering techniques in front of the children, us, because they didn't trust us, you know. I mean, if we know that we can just cheat and hold the heat down, we won't do the hard yards of getting the emissions down, so don't tell them. And, and what's changed in the scientific community is that they are so scared uh, that, you know, that game's over. Yeah, there's a moral hazard here. Moral hazard be damned. We're going to need this stuff. So let's get some research done, understand what the side effects might be. Um, so they've gone public. Um, what are your thoughts on geoengineering, Vardana Well, um, three thoughts. The first is, it is the idea of being able to engineer our lives on this very fragile and complex and interrelated and interconnected planet that's created the mess we are in. It's an engineering paradigm that created the fossil fuel age that gave us climate change. And Einstein warned us and said, you can't solve problems with the same mindset that created them. Geoengineering is trying to solve the problems with the same old mindset of controlling nature. And the phrase that was used of cheating, let's cheat. You can't cheat nature. That's something people should recognize by now. Uh, there is no cheating possible. Eventually, the laws of Gaia determine the final outcome. We need that sunlight for photosynthesis. The geoengineers don't realize sunshine is not a curse on the planet. The sun is not the problem. The problem is the mess of pollution we are creating. So again, we can't cheat. And the final issue is that these shortcuts that are attempted from places of power, and I would add places of ignorance, of the ecological web of life, are then creating the war solution. Because geoengineering becomes war on a planetary scale with ignorance and blind spots. Instead of taking the real path, which is helping communities adapt and become resilient. That's the work we do in India. We save the seeds that will be able to deal with sea level rise or cyclones so that we have salt tolerant varieties. We distributed them after the tsunami. Last year we had a monsoon failure. But instead of sending armies out, we distributed seeds. And the farmers who had seeds of millets had a crop. The farmers who were waiting for the Green Revolution chemical cultivation had a crop failure. So r building resilience and building adaptation is the human response. It's the ecological response. I talk about the fact that, you know, the, the oil culture has given us climate change. And if we continue on that same paradigm, the only next step is eco-imperialism. Grab what remains of the resources of the poor and take it to create insularity and a false defense and security, because the planet is interconnected, our lives are interconnected. The rich cannot isolate themselves in islands of defense against a planetary instability.